Welcome. We will start the webinar in a few minutes as we are waiting for all the attendees to come in. Hello, everyone. We will just wait for another minute. Um, we are still at, uh, admitting individuals to the webinar. We will start at 12.03, so just one more minute. We are going to start the webinar and we'll continue to admit all the attendees into this room. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Fiona Zhu. I'm Associate Director of Development for the George Washington University School of Business. Um, this webinar is hosted by the School of Business Alumni Relations Team and we're very excited to have this webinar with you today. Um, just a few housekeeping uh, for this webinar. Please use, use the Q&A functions uh, for your questions and we'll address all of your questions uh, towards the end of the panel. And then we will be recording the session today. Uh, there are many alumni who are unable to join, but they are very interested in this webinar. So we'll be sharing this recording with them and as they have any questions, uh, but I'm going to start introducing the panelists and then we will um, kick off the discussion today. So we are very excited today to have uh, Mari Adam, who is a senior wealth advisor for Mercer's Advisors, one of the top wealth managers nationwide. And Mari is also a GW School of Alumna uh, from the MBA program. So we're very excited to have Mari uh, to be one of our panelists today. And Mari is a certified financial planner. She has over 30 decades of experience helping client plan and invest for a better, more secure future. And prior to joining Mercer Advisors in 2019, she was a very successful female entrepreneur founding Adam Financial Associates, uh, a comprehensive wealth management firm in Florida. And in addition, so we have uh, Dr. Andrea Hassler, who's the Deputy Academic Director and Assistant Research Professor in Financial Literacy at the Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center at the George Washington University School of Business. Uh, Dr. Hassler has recently worked on projects focused on financial literacy levels of the young women entrepreneurs uh, investor and minority in the U.S. and around the world. 
And then you will hear from Kristen Burnell later of, um, in this panel. She is the executive director at the Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center at the George Washington University School of Business. Uh, Kristen applies her expertise in financial literacy and education to shape the overall goals and strategy of the center and to promote the development and measurement of financial education programs. Um, and I'm going to kick off the this, um, the, this past this to Andrea, who's going to kind of review the questions to the big three that you guys have seen on the slideshow. Thank you very much, Fiona. So can I quickly share my screen, please? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So. Here we go, you must be all excited to see the solutions to our three big three questions. So this, these are the three questions that you just saw on our slideshow. So the first one is asking about numeracy. So it's about $100 in the savings account, 2% interest rate per year, how much do you have after five years? It's, and the, you see the answer question, the answer options there already. It's more than 102. So, but if you see already, we are not asking about the, the knowledge of the, of the compound interest concept. It's really pure numeracy that we are asking in this first question. The second question is about inflation. And of course, if the inflation rate is 2%, the interest rate is 1% per year, then we have less in a, in a year in, in the account than today. And the last one is the risk diversification question. And that actually asks whether a company stock, a single company stock is safer then a stock mutual fund, and of course, this is false. So these are the th big three questions that I will be talking about a lot today. Uh, I just want to kick off here before we go dive into the questions, also about the benefits of financial literacy. And, and we, we show with our research, and you might be well aware um, that people with higher financial literacy are better at managing their debt, for example, are better able to um, cope with the financial shock are less worried about making ends meet and also are better at planning and saving for their retirement, just to name a few. But in addition to that, what I actually wanted to, to show you today and bring is a new statistic that we recently added to a survey. And I think it's, it's, it, 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 adds, it adds a lot of, a, a lot, a lot of new flavor because I feel like we have from time to time, we always feel, we, we feel all of us, I believe that we don't have enough time. So our time is flying by so fast. So what we actually asked in the new survey in this year's wave of the TIA Institute Chief like Personal Finance Index was how much time, how many hours per week do you spend thinking about and dealing with financial issues and problems related to your personal finances? And what we see is that actually people on average spend seven hours per week, which is, if you think, almost an entire work day. And so we also asked how many hours occur at work, and that are these are on average three hours per week. Then what I did was, okay, I thought, let's split it by financial literacy levels. And that's what you see here. So the dark blue bars are all adults, the average hours they spend per week thinking about and dealing with issues and problems related to personal finances. And we have four bars. That means those on the very left are those who show low financial literacy levels. And those on the very right, a hand side are those with high financial literacy levels. And here we ask not only three questions, we actually ask 28 questions on to assess financial literacy. That's why we have the four bars. But if you just look at the numbers, so among those who show low financial literacy that these are actually 11 hours on average per week, and that decreases to three hours among those who show high financial literacy levels. So that's just um, to kick off and see that and show that financial literacy really matters a lot. Thank you. No, this is great. Um, thank you for sharing the inf important data. So I'm going to ask the first questions uh, to Dr. Hessler. So can you address the current state of financial literacy in the US and around the globe? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. And I'll share my screen again. 
because I brought some figures and the most important figure that I'd like you to know, to remember, take away from this part of the presentation is one third. So overall, we see that um, financial literacy levels are very low and about 30% of US adults could only answer the big three financial literacy questions. And I split that now um, across age. So we see that, and you see here the, the different bars and the ones on the very left are the ones who are 18 to 24 years old and on the Hmong Do, that group, only 13% could answer the big three financial literacy question that we just that we just looked at um, in my very first slide. And to go back to that one third that I mentioned, um, if you look at the whole distribution or the, the, the involvement, the trend here, it shows that financial literacy increases with age, but it increases very slowly. So learning by doing is actually not enough because one third of Americans only know the big three basic concepts by age 50. Even though if you think that by age 50, yeah, there, you have made a lot of financial decisions already. So it, it starts as early as high school with, um, with the question how to finance college. And then of course, how to pay back student loans and how to, how to manage career, how, how to set up mortgages, how to pay back mortgages, saving for retirement, just, just to name a few. But that's basically to start here. Um, and what's also very worrisome is if you look at the whole distribution is that the young greatly lack financial knowledge. So the, the, those at the, at the very left, we see that even at, by age 30, only 18% could correctly answer the big three financial literacy questions. Now, you also asked me, Fiona, um, this is all data from 2018, I have to say, from the US. Now, you also asked me, how does it look like around the globe? And that's what I have here. So we see that only one third of adults worldwide, so it's not just in the US, it's actually worldwide, could answer um, are financially literate. So and that's based on the S&P Global Financial Literacy Survey, which we conducted together with the World Bank and Gallup in 2014. And it's actually the largest and most comprehensive global measure that we have um, to date because we, ends, we asked 150,000 adults uh, in more than 148 countries. So if you look at just like how the blue is distributed, it's all basically the same color. So this shows that the world is flat when it comes to financial literacy because illiteracy is really widely spread. And now just my last slide um, is you might think now, okay, we have talked about the big three, but how does it actually look if we look at the different answers for all three questions? And that's my last slide. So we have again, the numeracy question, inflation and risk diversification. And here we are with the US again in 2018, and we see that the numeracy question, the $102 um, after five years is the one that people know the best. So 72% answered that correctly. If you look at the inflation question, only 55 answered that correctly at 55%. And the risk diversification, so understanding risk, managing risk is here with, among the big three, but also with all the other research that we, that we have been doing and other questions that we have been asking. Risk is always the concept that, have, that people have the most difficulty to grasp. And then interesting that, that we these are the black, blue bars. If you look at the yellow bars, these are the answers, the percentage of people who answered with don't know. We see that among those um, who answered the highest with don't know is actually, again, with the risk diversification question. So almost half answered uh, with don't know. All right. No, this is quite shocking to see all this research and there's definitely a big financial literacy crisis. Um, but I'm gonna ask Mari if you can chime in to kind of talk about what you have witnessed and your reaction to GFLEX research from your, sure. as, from your work. Definitely. First, I just like to say congratulations to GFLEX for 10 amazing years of research advocacy and education in, in financial literacy. So congratulations on that. Uh, to answer your question, what have I seen as a practitioner? You know, what is the state of financial literacy? I think the short answer is it's definitely not where we want it to be. Uh, financial literacy is really a basic life skill. And as Andrea mentioned, it's absolutely critical today because people have decisions, they come into the workforce, 
They have to sign up for a 401k plan if there is one. They have to choose their investments. They have to sign up for a medical insurance or go on the ACA, which by the way are pretty complicated decisions there. Should I get a car loan? How long should it be? How am I gonna pay for this? Do I get a mortgage? What kind of mortgage? So there's a number of very complicated decisions out there that people have to make decisions about. And it's really not that dissimilar from knowing how to read and write several decades ago. These are basic skills. And just like I have my smartphone here, just like knowing how to use your smartphone without knowing how to use this, you can't get in your accounts anymore. You, I can't even call my kids because I can't remember their phone numbers. But financial literacy is really that kind of very basic skill nowadays that we absolutely need. And I think GFLAC has done a wonderful job focusing on why that's so important. And just stepping back one little thing, that in the United States, our system to a large extent is based on you solving your own financial problems. So if you want to have money for retirement, you can't just say, I'm going to receive it from Social Security. You are not. So it's absolutely imperative here that people take that responsibility for planning for their own financial security. So when they don't have the financial literacy to do that, you have people who really are not able to be financial, financially independent. And GFLEC has really pointed that out in their research with financial fragility and some of the resilience studies, why this is so important to make the right decisions so you can live the life you want and have freedom of choice. And no, that's great. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, so my next questions, I'll also start with Dr. Hessler is, who are the vulnerable groups within this big financial literacy crisis right now? Mm -hmm. And I brought again a few slides with me. Uh, we saw already with the graph that I showed at the very beginning across the age that the young are very vulnerable. So young still have to learn a lot and cannot answer the big three questions that well. But also I have a few other slides just to show you that also financial literacy, there are large differences across income. So on the left-hand side, the dark blue bars show different income levels. And we have there um, on the very left, those who earn less than $25,000 a year. And on the very right are those who earn more than $100,000 a year. And you see that financial literacy levels are really different across the different groups, but still they are fairly low. And if you look at the median income, which is an income bracket between 50 to $75,000, so right the middle bar, it's only one third who could answer the big three correctly. And then we also see really that uh, education makes a difference as well. That's on the right hand side, where we have the yellow bars, where we have those with a high school degree or lower on the very left, and then those with a college degree or more on, on the very right. And we see that there is a clear educational divide between those with a college degree who could answer among those 49%, almost half, could answer the big three versus then those who own, who have some college but did not did not earn a degree or those with a high school education. So then also what we see is a large gender gap in financial literacy, and that's very striking here. Again, U.S. data from 2018 among women, 22% could answer the financial literacy questions correctly. And among men, it was 39%. And we actually did the same, um, the same study also around the globe. And we used again that the global financial literacy survey that I mentioned before, that we that where we asked the financial literacy question in, in 40, 148 countries. And we saw that the gender gap is prevalent in so many different countries all around the world. So it's not just in the US, it's really global. And with the other studies that we did, it was that we saw that women are disproportionately more likely than men to respond to the question with, I don't know. So part of the gender gap is also due to lack of confidence. But if you think that do, um, answering with do not know also means that women are aware that they don't know. So when we so we can use that when we promote financial education program and, and when we try to get women engaged. And I 
took that study one, one, one step further and looked only at the women and split the women across race, race and ethnicity. And what we actually see is that black and Hispanic women show the lowest levels of financial literacy. So we have again on the very left, 22%, these are all women. Then among white Americans, 25% could answer the big three questions correctly, but that drops really um, a lot uh, among black and Hispanic women. So we see here, basically with that chart, that there is a double vulnerability in, 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 in financial literacy. Great, no, that's quite shocking to see. Um, Mari, um, I would love you to kind of talk about, as a practitioner um, experience, do you see very similar, um, what the GFLAC data is showing from the client you work with and from your experience? Yeah, I, I absolutely do see the impact of Andrea's data. So if we start by saying there's already gaps in financial literacy and people don't know as much as we want them to know, I would say it is absolutely devastating to see how these gaps in financial literacy affect women, people of color, and other un underrepresented groups. Uh, and just to give you some context, we know that for women, somewhere between 90 to 95 percent of all women at some point in their lives will be solely responsible for managing their finances due to divorce, being single, widowhood. So imagine you have almost all women will be responsible for handling their finances, yet the level of financial literacy and the knowledge of money is, is just not there. So part of it starts with the earnings gap where you know probably in general that women make about 81 or 82 cents on the dollar compared to men. And sometimes people will say, you know, what's the big deal? That's 18 cents, right? But over a 40 year career, let's say from age 23 to age 63, that 18 cents adds up to be almost a million dollars. And if you factor in time out of the workforce due to having children or caregiving for parents, the gap in earnings is well over a million dollars. The result of this is when we look at accumulated wealth, and I think Andrea has a slide on that we can look at in a minute, accumulated wealth, women have one third the wealth of men. And if you look at people of color and you break it down by groups, it's, it's negligible wealth compared to other other groups compared to men. You can see this here on the slide, it's really striking. So women, because of these gaps in not just earnings, but also financial literacy, they have one third the wealth accumulated of men. And that's important because women live longer than men. Therefore, in, in my practice, I know that women in general need a lot more money than men because they're going to live more years. What makes this, I think, even more striking is if we look at research, we are seeing this gap in wealth, in knowledge, appear in young women as young as 16 to 25. So when you're looking at research, women 16 to 25, they're in high school or maybe in college or barely out of college. What we're seeing is young women at that age already have 40% less wealth than men. And one statistic, they have half the number of investment accounts as men. And this is really directly from financial literacy. What you're seeing is women might know how to save money. They, they frequently are earning money in their jobs, but they're starting to accumulate more debt. And if they do save, they're not translating that savings into investing. And that's a common problem where we see financial literacy breaking down with women. They save money, but they don't invest it for the longer term. So definitely the lower levels of financial literacy, even as young as high school, is creating this gap in wealth between men and women. And, and again, that's why I think the research that GFLEC is doing is so important to try to pin down when this starts and, and lead itself to solutions on how we can try to fix it and help women catch up and other, other groups as well. 
that is extremely valuable and important. Um, and I have one more question. And I just want to remind all the attendees, if you have any questions, uh, please put into the Q&A functions. We will start taking questions in a few minutes. Uh, so my last question to both of you, I think is some, uh, a question that everyone's very interested in. So what are the solution to this big financial literacy crisis? Then what can people do to kind of, you know, get over this big problem right now? Uh, so maybe I'll start with Mari. If you want to take this question first, then we'll go to Andrea. Thank you. So I have four ideas I'm going to throw out. I'm going to try to run through these quickly. Number one is school. When I talk to college groups or even my own kids, they always say, mom, why don't they teach us this in school? <laughs> that's, that's not my uh, field of study, but it, they really need to. You need to teach it middle school, high school, college. It's just astonishing when you go to talk to people who are going out in the real world. Even my own kids will say, how do I sign up for my medical plan at work? How should I allocate my 401k dollars? So Number one, we really need this taught more, and I know GFLEC is focused on that. Number two is parents. If you have kids or grandkids or nieces and nephews, you really need to talk about money around the dining room table, especially for young women. It's not a bad subject. You know, we're taught, don't talk about what, sex, religion, politics at the table, but money should not be there. There's nothing wrong with talking about money. A lot of women feel it's shameful, it's greedy. I've had, again, this conversation with my daughter. It's not a bad thing to have money because money is a tool that lets you make choices in your life and having more choice is always good. So please, if you have younger people around your household, talk about money, show them how it works, especially young women. Three is just ask questions and empower yourself. I think as a woman in my profession and other women like me, we generally got here because we had experiences where we weren't treated well. Maybe people talked down to us or you all probably know you go to buy a car and someone says, next time come back with your husband or something like that. And for a lot of women in my profession, this is empowering us to learn more, to take charge. And for me, that was one of the reasons I came back to GW to do an MBA because I totally changed careers and ended up for a 30 year career in personal finance. So, so go figure. And the fourth thing, and I know GFLEC does focus on this. It's, it's a little harder to explain, but I think it's very important to have empathy. And empathy just means that we all come to this point from different places and along different roads. My reality is very different from someone else's. And it's very important to create this space where everyone feels comfortable asking questions and learning more because the money experience is very different as GFLEX research shows for different ethnic groups. Um, so it's very important to have empathy and make sure we try to get more people in the profession who can make clients or consumers feel comfortable. We really need more diversity and inclusion in the personal finance profession. And I think we're all working toward that and, and hopefully we'll get there and that will make consumers feel much more comfortable as they make money decisions. Um, Dr. Hassler, would you like to kind of chime in on from the GFLEC and the research you guys have done? Uh, what do you think are the solution to this crisis? Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I can only agree uh, with, with Mari's four solutions. I, I love them. So that's that's very much in line with what, what we see as well. So we really need large and scalable initiatives that can be in, a, in schools, the workplace, communities. So these are all platforms that provide unique opportunities to deliver financial education also to a large segment of the population. So it's always also where do we reach where, where, where do we reach the, um, the, the folks? And as, as Mari said, the school is definitely the place to start. And if you are interested in some resources, so what we have, we have an entire website. It's called fastlane-education.org. And that's a website that's only dedicated to promote financial education in high schools. And we provide research-based guidance, tools, um, support, materials to students, to teachers, to school administrators, also to parents. 
and policymakers and community members. So there are tailored resources out there. And that's actually also for the parents, but what Mari mentioned, parents play a huge and crucial role as well. And we have resources out there. So how to talk with your kids about personal finances and how to make it also fun and not, and not a boring topic. That's another thing. So we have, we have their videos and games and stuff like that. So there's a lot of resources that you can that you can tap into because really in schools and learning at young age because what kids have um a, what, what's most valuable asset is time right so because they have time and as soon as uh, as early as they know how to save and how to invest that's actually that then money works for 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 us right and um if we invest early that accumulated interest with the compound interest, which I always feel like this is magic, it actually gives me in the end um, a lot more for my retirement. And then one um, point I would like to add is also to provide education in the workplace, because it's an impactful way to reach a large share of the population. And um, we have we have we have we have created a, um, a a lot of programs with employers and um, there are a lot of um, components that we also have on our website that that play into an effective workplace financial wellness programs and really important what 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 Mari um, added as her last point with empathy is really to have also customized programs i think that 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 fits well to have to have a program that's targeted to the needs of the audience so because every employee um, has unique needs and financial circumstances so we really need to have a tailored financial wellness programs that's and then it is more effective because it is targeting the needs and the question the the, the people have that it is best addressed to so that's um, that's in in a in a nutshell what we have and then of, or what we think is really important and then the community. So the community can also be reached through museums, libraries, theaters, and so on. Basically, places where people gather and go to learn. No, great, thank you. No, I think this is really shocking, and there's so much more we can do. And thank you to G Flex for all the work that you guys have done, and Mari for being, you know, advocating for all of us um, and be a certified financial planner. And so we're going to move into the Q&A sessions. Um, so I have received a few questions um, so far. So I'm going to start with one that I think everyone might be really interested in learning more about is, can you take a moment to address the impact of COVID-19 on household around the world uh, that related to the financial literacy and financial planning? Uh, I'll start with Dr. Hassler. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, of course. I mean, we have we have seen that COVID um, and all the economic consequences that that came out of COVID with the shutdowns and everything was re was really devastating for for people. We have so big lines at the food banks. We saw in our research that so many struggled with making ends meet. So it is. Um, I, if I remember correctly, it was was around um, thirty percent. Who, who had um, problems making ends meet, um, had problems with paying down their, their debt or even the, 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 the interest. Um, what was interesting was I also added to a survey that we just collected in last January, um, I added a question whether COVID and the economic consequences have, has motivated the survey respondent to learn more about personal finances and to, and to really address that. And uh, it was really, really interesting that a large share of the population is, is motivated and wants to learn more and that COVID has sparked that. And what was interesting to see is also that among the most vulnerable, so people who have the lowest financial literacy levels and also those who have the, the, the most trouble making ends meet, that motivation was even higher. So we can, I feel like going back to what we said before about the solutions with um, ramping up our, our efforts to, to promote financial education and get the financial education in schools and the workplace. Now is, now is the best time to, to do that because we see also that people are motivated. They have seen now something can happen, something can happen that we have never expected and it can be really devastating and we need to plan for it. Mar Mari, um, have you seen any of your 
and that you work with in the past couple of months, um, 18, 19 months, been impacted by the pandemic? And what are some of the things that you have seen? De definitely everyone has been impacted. Unfortunately, as you probably know, when COVID started, we called it a she session because the impact on women, especially lower income women, women who were the most vulnerable, who had childcare issues, they were really the ones that were hurt the most. Um, but you see it at all levels. I think people became much more aware of the need to do estate planning. How many people we've been saying, please, you need basic estate planning documents and they put us off. I think now they understand why. You need to have that emergency fund. So I would agree entirely with Andrea. You really see a greater awareness of our vulnerabilities. And some people are motivated to try to strengthen their, their position, but it's been a, a difficult situation. And, and Finally, the, the bottom line is you see more people questioning what they do and why they do it, saying, if life is so, I can be so vulnerable, how do I want to spend my time? And I suppose that's always healthy, the question how you want to be spending your time, do you want to spend it commuting and going to work? So it is healthy. Unfortunately, it has hurt people who have the least means uh, the most, and those who are, who are most well off have have done better in COVID, which is unfortunate. Right. Um, so I think then I have two questions. I'm going to also invite Kristen to join us. Uh, I think these two questions, uh, I think one is how can financial literacy be taught in school? And I think also more related to maybe the GW School of Business students or the GW students, what have we done um, to kind of really help educate our students about financial literacy. And I will invite Kristen and Dr. Hassler to mention a little bit more about GFLEX work. Thank you, Fiona. It's uh, great to see everyone. And, and uh, thank you, Mari and Andrea for, for the presentation thus far. Uh, in terms of GFLEX work, uh, when it uh, was founded by Anna Maria Lasardi, our academic director, 10 years ago, she also started a course on personal finance at GW for graduate students. Uh, and then, and that course continues. Uh, we also more recently were able to add a course for undergraduates. And um, now that she uh, has been promoted to university professor, there's also another co course for uh, honor students. These courses are not uh, mandatory. Uh, we would love to see uh, personal finance being required and the uh, reviews that the feedback that Dr. Lasardi receives from the students is very positive. Uh, but at this stage, it is um, a voluntary uh, course, uh, but we do see some, some great results. I think such a, I would love, I would personally love to take this course if I can't go back. To <laughs> she would love to let you sit in on it. Because <laughs> I think such an important part. Um, and I think someone also asked if you can talk a little bit more about GFLEX history and the work that you guys do. Um, and I know this year is the 10th anniversary for GFLEX. Uh, if you would like to talk a little bit about all the amazing things you have, have done, the impact you have been able to provide to the whole community, not just in the US, but globally. Happy to, and that's um, some of what, and, and maybe we should have kicked off with it instead of having at the end that I, I wanted to talk about because it's it's been a pleasure. I joined GFLEC just a few months after its founding and so have been part of uh, its 10 year history um, and seen the changes and the impact. And so, um, you know, when we launched 10 years ago, we had a very clear vision that everyone around the world would be equipped with the financial knowledge they need to manage their money. Uh, that that stays our, our vision. Uh, for us, it's a happiness project. As Mari has mentioned, you know, it's about giving choices uh, to people that if they have the financial knowledge to help build uh, their their wealth and be more financially secure and resilient, um, they're in a better position to pursue their dreams. Uh, and so at GFLEC, uh, throughout our decade, we have really focused on making um, that vision a reality in four ways. We conduct research and evaluations. 
Uh, we also teach at GW, as I was just mentioning, uh, and we advise on and build programs themselves. And we also make policy recommendations within the US, but also internationally. Uh, and one story as we were talking about the uh, the uh, the GW course, but also just the, the value of financial literacy and the impact of, of our uh, our work. Um, one story comes to mind of a, an, a GW uh, School of Business alum uh, named Charlinda. She received a master's in accountancy a few years ago. And while she was at the school, she took uh, Dr. Lasardi's personal finance course. And Charlinda really credits this course with helping to motivate her and educate her on how to pay off her student loans and quickly. So she had $80,000 in student loans and she paid them off in four years, I mean, which is just incredible. So that power of, um, of knowledge and how to get it done. And of course, a, a very motivated individual um, who was, was willing to make some tough decisions to do that. Um, and so in this last decade, our research programs and the courses like the one Charlinda took have raised awareness and put the financial illiteracy crisis on the agenda of policymakers, private sector leaders, and educators around the world. Um, we have also worked really hard to inspire the study of financial literacy and personal finance, among other researchers. When GFLEC was founded, financial literacy was a topic. It wasn't yet a field. Um, and with um, the help of our research and our leadership in building a community of researchers on the topic, it is now officially a field of study. Um, it has its own ac academic code, G53. We are very proud of G53 and, and um, like to think that we have helped make it happen um, in the last 10 years. Uh, but certainly our work is not done. So we have surmounted a lot of major obstacles, but um, as we celebrate our decennial, we also are, are looking to the future and, and have our priorities and goals to continue to, to make a big difference. And I can speak more about, about the, the future goals uh, in, a, in a bit, but that gives a bit of, uh, of the history. Um, I can speak a lot more, and, and if anyone wants to reach out to me, uh, you're welcome to at, at kburnell at gwu.edu. No, that's great. Um, and then I think I have one other question. Uh, I think everyone who are here today and who are unable to join us, how can they get involved if they are really interested, they want to support this effort, they want to learn more, what are the ways that they can get involved? So there, there are a, a few ways, and, and Mari has been a, a wonderful um, friend and supporter and advocate of, of GFLEC for um, its entire uh, decade of existence and, and hope she'll continue on our, our journey. Um, and so, and um, ways that Mari and others have been able to support us. Um, one is through um, philanthropy. We are a self-funded center at the School of Business as all uh, centers are. So we could not, um, exist and accomplish what we've done without uh, the generosity of others. Um, and uh, we also uh, uh, ask that people who are interested and passionate about our, uh, about our work be ambassadors of GFLEC and financial literacy overall. Uh, by being part of this webinar, uh, we will be adding you to our mailing list. Uh, so you will be getting updates uh, about GFLEC, our work, uh, invited to some of our events. We do uh, Connecting to Reimagine webinar series each month. Um, and so they're to really uh, help share and disseminate uh, the work that we're doing with others in your community uh, and helping to connect them with us and, and or uh, with the, the passion and, and in their own way contributing uh, we do have a few very specialized volunteer opportunities as a research center. It's a little harder to have research opportunity or volunteer opportunities uh, like some nonprofits do where you, you would go and teach in, in different um, classrooms and schools or, or whatnot. Uh, but we do have a few. If you're interested in that, you may also reach out to me. Um, and uh, and if you're interested in, in volunteering in the schools themselves and things, I am also very happy to recommend some some great organizations that we partner with. So those are just 
a, a few ideas. That's great. Thank you. So I think we're going to wrap up um, kind of this webinar, um, but I'm going to let Kristen say a few more words about GFlex, um, and then we'll close out this webinar today. Thank you. And um, again, I just want to, uh, you know, uh, say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where in the world you're joining us from. Um, and I really thank uh, you for tuning in. And I also want to thank uh, Mari and Andrea and Fiona for this wonderful program and taking the time uh, to put this together and, and the alumni team at the School of Business for organizing it and helping us celebrate our, our 10th anniversary. Um, so I, I talked a little about uh, already our, our history and, and the impact we've made, and we um, want to certainly celebrate that. This is our anniversary season. The entire uh, last quarter of, of the calendar year we'll be celebrating, so keep a, an eye out for new research that's going to be coming out and um, various announcements and things. Uh, and uh, we are still, though, very much committed to uh, our work and uh, setting our priorities and goals that ultimately uh, will make help make sure that everyone in the world is financially literate. Uh, so as we've mentioned on, on this uh, webinar today, financial education must start in childhood and continue to be built upon throughout life. Um, our work to get financial education in schools, workplaces, and other uh, community settings, as well as to measure these programs, will continue. Uh, that will remain a, a strong um, top priority for us. Um, and also, considering how beneficial financial literacy is for one's financial well-being, it's also a powerful force for tackling systematic inequalities. So, and uh, Andrea talked about some of those um, statistics that our research has helped uncover uh, and uh, we will make sure uh, in research that we're working on now and in the future that we uh, expand upon our research and programmatic efforts to tackle systematic inequalities uh, for underserved and, and vul vulnerable groups. Um, I do want to say it's not that we see financial literacy as the silver bullet and the only change that needs to happen uh, in order for one to achieve financial well-being or uh, to tackle inequalities, but the research does show it does make a, a significant impact and the research um, uh, we are often leading the way of, of providing this new research. I was just on a call last week with a woman who's a founder of a nonprofit to support Black women in, the, in America. And she was saying, she until she came across our research that looked at a comparison of the gender gap within uh, the Black American community, she couldn't find statistics. It, um, the research was just lumping um, Blacks together uh, and not breaking out gender. Um, and then she came across our research, which, of course, um, she recognized and, and commented how important that is as she um, determines programs, make choices about her, her own nonprofit. Um, so we will continue um, to do that work. Uh, everyone, as you saw from our research, um, everyone needs more financial literacy. Even that global map, um, the darkest blue is the most financially literate countries, but that only went to 75% of the adult population being financially literate. Uh, so we need to uh, focus on financial education overall, but certain groups um, are especially uh, vulnerable given various circumstances. And so we need to have um, an inclusive tackling of financial education and bringing people uh, up together. And that will not just help individuals, but uh, our community and, and macro economy overall. Uh, so this is just a, a sneak peek at what we have planned at GFLEC uh, as we move forward into our next decade. And I, I want to offer a huge thanks to those who have been part of our first 10 years. We could not have accomplished what we did without you. Uh, and I invite those who are not yet involved to join our journey as supporters and advocates uh, as we move into our, our next decade. Uh, so again, please reach out to me. Fiona has put my email address in the chat. Um, 
if you would like to get more involved and, and learn more, uh, reach out to me. You can go to our website, gflec.org. Uh, and together we can make sure we see widespread concrete change in financial literacy levels and financial well-being. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you to everyone who are able to tune in today. We appreciate your participation. And thank you to our panelists, Andrea, Mari, and Kristen, for your participation and all the great work that you guys do. Uh, Mari and I are very excited to see what's next for GFLEC the next 10 years. And I know that you guys will be doing an amazing job to tackle this financial literacy crisis in the U.S. and globally. So thank you to everyone. Uh, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with all the information we shared today and information to get connected to GFLEX. So I highly encourage everyone to look at their resources, their re research and get involved, be an ambassador, be a donor, be a volunteer. There's so much work to be done. Um, so thank you so much for all of your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Congratulations thank you. again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Happy birthday, G Fleck. <laughs> Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone for joining.